For regular videos on ancient cultures and forgotten civilizations, please subscribe. As you may know, this channel is known for looking into pseudo-historical and pseudo-archaeological claims from time to time. If you're not certain what I mean by pseudo-archaeology, I have a video on the subject, Pseudo-Archaeology, What Is It?, which you can check out. But one thing I've never done, and what I would like to do now, is talk a bit about some of the scientific principles used in pseudo-archaeology or pseudo-history that might sound scientific, but are not actually good science. I guess we should not be surprised by this. If it's not possible to use real science to support your claims, it becomes necessary to resort to fake science or outdated and discredited forms of science. Granted, some people take the mystical route and say they uh, can determine ancient history through clairvoyance or supernatural revelation, but a far more common persuasive tactic that proponents of fake archaeological ideas use to convince people that they know what they're talking about is to dress it up in the garb of science. After all, if you can make a kooky idea sound scientific, it won't sound so kooky anymore. So I have put together a list of some examples of bad science that I have found to be popular in the fake archaeology world. I thought I would share them with you because people without a background in these areas of research might not realize that what they're hearing is pseudoscience. I'll tell you what these positions are and what exactly is wrong with them. I would like to start with a couple of ideas that originated in the field of anthropology back in the 19th century, and have long since been discarded because it was realized that they were bunk. The first is hyperdiffusionism, also known as heliocentric diffusionism. Diffusionism itself is an accepted concept in anthropology. It refers to the spread of a cultural item from uh, one society to another. Cultural items include any aspect of culture. But in the case of material remains, we're talking about architectural styles, art styles, writing styles, any aspect of culture that could be found in the archaeological record. And the way they can be diffused is through some kind of contact, trade, migration, conquest, etc. Sometimes migration is considered a separate phenomenon from diffusion, migration being a way to spread culture by people moving and diffusion by not moving but others just call it all diffusion. And everyone agrees that diffusion takes place, not only now, but all through history. What is especially interested anthropologists is the spread of cultural innovations. How did an invention spread to other cultures? This also interests pseudo-archaeologists. But hyperdiffusionism is an idea that comes from the 19th century in the early and primitive days of anthropological studies. There was an interest in how human cultural characteristics were spread around the world, and specifically the cultural traits of civilization. It was commonly believed by Europeans of that time that there were primitive cultures and advanced cultures, and that the primitive cultures were inferior and the advanced cultures were superior. Civilization was what made them superior. So how did civilization spread around the world? One school of thought was what we call heliocentric. That is, it suggested that civilization came from one place. There was one cultural center that developed civilization, and then from there, all the major aspects of civilization diffused to other societies around the world. This is what heliocentric diffusionism is. The British school of thought on diffusion argued that Egypt was the original civilization, and that through migration and colonization, civilization spread to other places. Therefore, all advanced cultures owed their origin to Egypt. The German school of thought was more tempered. It argued that there were several cultural centers of the world, and that from these, through the expansion of cultural uh, circles, the common aspects of culture were diffused around the world. Now, the reason why the British form, heliocentric diffusionism, was rejected and considered extreme is because it did not account for independent invention. 
The German idea was more reasonable, but it too has not survived intact. So we had these conflicting points of view. But as anthropological science progressed, a synthesis was formed, which takes into account both ideas. Diffusion clearly happened, and independent cultural development also happened. This is usually called cultural evolution. To favor too heavily one idea over the other ignores the evidence that we now have, evidence for both. And we also have to figure in acculturation, which is when two neighboring cultures exchange information. It doesn't just go one way. So when you see the idea being propounded, even today, that there was one great ancient civilization that was the mother of all the other civilizations, this is the antiquated idea of heliocentric diffusionism, which ignores other ways for the development of an innovation. It is a holdover from the days of early anthropology. Let me add that there was another opposing school of thought on this question at that time, which also has since been discredited and which amateurs today sometimes still adhere to, and that is social evolution. As you may know, the theory of biological evolution was growing in popularity beginning in the late 1800s, and so some anthropologists applied it to culture. In their opinion, all humans share the same psychological traits. They called this the psychic unity of mankind. These traits made them equally likely to innovate. What this means is that if you put humans anywhere, they're eventually going to invent civilization on their own. So, according to social evolutionists, civilizations popped up independently of one another, for it was simply destined to be. Social evolution is an extreme idea that got discarded for the obvious reason that it supposes diffusion had little effect on cultural development. And we can see now from the archaeological record that it did. Also, the idea that civilization was inevitable and that every culture given time would arrive there was discarded because it leaves out individual needs, concerns, environment, and achievements. Complex states, in fact, never had to happen. So the next time you hear someone argue, hey, we humans have been around for millions of years. Are you trying to tell me that they never thought up civilization until 6,000 years ago? Come on. Keep this in mind. There's no reason to believe that urban society is wired into humans. The idea that there was a simple linear progression of society that began with barbarism and ended with a civilization, based on what Europeans thought of as a civilization, became a staple in the Western education system early on, and is still commonly believed among the general population, even though the evidence has convinced anthropologists and archaeologists to move past that mindset. The reality was more complex than that. Related to the idea of diffusion is the principle of homology, which is the idea that because two cultural items have a similar appearance or a similar function, they must have a common origin. Interestingly, this manner of thinking also owes its origin to the theory of biological evolution or the thinking that comes from it. When biologists look at the similarity between animals or plants and when they find a similar feature in two species, they might suppose that they had a common ancestor. So in a similar way, people will look at photos of pyramids from two different countries or works of art or any cultural similarity, and then they will suppose that they are homologous. That is, they derive from a common ancestor. But this is a simplistic approach to the subject because there is not only homology, there is also analogy, which is the idea that things can have similar features but have different origins. And pseudo-archaeologists almost never consider analogy. Even in biology, analogy is considered. Both bats and birds and pterodactyls have wings, but biologists have not concluded that they have a common ancestor. Their wings are analogous, not homologous. When some people look at pyramids from around the world, not only do they neglect to consider that the similarity could be incidental, they will doctor the evidence to remove as many differences as possible to strengthen their claim of homology. A good way to determine whether a similarity is incidental is to consider whether the similarity is functionally necessary. If it is, then it is more likely to be incidental. For example, for step pyramids to hold up, 
a larger bottom and a smaller top are functionally necessary. This tips the scale in favor of analogy. Another thing to consider is whether there are many similar features between the cultures being compared, besides just a few that can be counted on one hand. The more commonality, the more the scale tips towards homology. Also important to consider is how close in time and space the two cultures were. If they were close, then contact is more likely. A more recent pseudoscience is precisionism, an idea popularized by a machinist named Christopher Dunn. The basic concept is that certain ancient artifacts, almost always stone artifacts, have been made so precisely that it would have been impossible for known ancient peoples to have made them. The intent here is to attribute the manufacture of these items to an unknown civilization with more advanced tools. This idea is based on the premise that accuracy in manufacture is determined by the tool, not by the person or persons operating the tool. Now, this is a claim that has never been accepted by the scientific community, nor has anyone ever attempted to demonstrate it to be true in a study published in a scientific journal. It is merely an assumption. The only support for it you will ever hear is an argument from authority, such as someone saying, well, I'm an engineer, or I'm a stonemason, or I'm a fill in the blank, and I know this is true. They want you to accept it because of who is saying it, rather than on the argument itself. That should raise a red flag right there. Not only has this principle never been supported by any scientific research, but it is demonstrably irrational for several reasons. First of all, a tool, no matter how advanced, is only as effective as the person operating it. This is well known simply from experience. Give the most sophisticated tool to an inexperienced child, and what are you going to get? Similarly, you can give a skilled artisan a random rock and a piece of stone, and they can create a masterpiece. Tools don't make artifacts. People do. Second, it ignores all the evidence from periods when we are absolutely certain what the tools were, such as the medieval period, when amazingly precise stonework was crafted. But there wasn't any super advanced machinery. There were no computers. Third, it ignores the evidence of techniques that were developed over the centuries and which people still use today to achieve highly accurate work, such as methods for achieving highly accurate flatness and highly accurate circles or arcs. For thousands of years, artisans have known that if you spin an object on a mount that is fixed to an arbor and the abrading tool is anchored so it doesn't move while working the surface, you're going to get a perfectly round object. The less pressure from the tool, and the faster the spin, the more accurate it will be. Fourth, the emphasis on stone manufacture and not on other material suggests that the argument is primarily based on the difficulty of cutting stone rather than on the precision itself. Fifth, it reasons backwards from the finished product, assuming that the object as they see it was exactly what the artisan intended. Even imperfection they attribute to intent. Then they say it was impossible to achieve this result by ordinary means. This is circular reasoning. Sixth, it suggests that someone went through the trouble of using highly advanced machines to create everyday household items for no apparent reason. Telluric energies and ley lines. This is one you sometimes hear about. The idea is that important ancient sites are connected by a grid of lines and that a form of energy runs through these lines. Somehow, ancient people all around the world knew about these lines, and that's why they built the structures where they did. This idea goes back to a fellow named Alfred Watkins, who coined the term ley lines back in the 1920s, when he noticed that ancient sites seemed to be aligned with others. He suggested that the lines represented ancient tracks that prehistoric people traversed. More likely than not, there were roads that connected ancient sites, and wouldn't be surprising, at least on flat land, that the roads would be straight. After all, the shortest distance between two points is the way you want to make your road. Watkins did not attribute any special energy to these lines. That idea was added by people of the New Age movement later on. You'll find that people will use scientific terminology to make this idea seem more believable. One proposal is that telluric currents run through these lines. To be clear, telluric currents are real. There is 
a natural, low-frequency electric current flowing beneath the Earth's surface or in the seas. These have already been scientifically detected and are the result of changes in the outer part of the Earth's magnetic field. These currents captured the imagination of many and have been used in science fiction movies and the like. But that these currents run through ley lines that connect ancient sites? No. Scientists have never traced any telluric current along a ley line. In fact, they have never even detected anything along a ley line. Ley lines are not accepted by geography or geology either because all they are is lines, simple lines drawn by people on maps to connect one place to another. No magnetometers or any other scientific devices have ever discovered a ley line. Instead, what you will hear are people who claim to be able to sense or feel the energies within their bodies. But this is straight up woo and not science. But lines drawn between significant ancient sites are a lot like drawing lines between stars to create constellations. It's our brains that pick out these patterns. That doesn't mean the ancient people were thinking just as we did. And in this case, it would have to include ancient people around the world who were networking in some way. The potential data points that can be used for this number in the thousands, which just opens up the possibility so much that almost any pattern can be created. And when you take into consideration that the sites that leyline enthusiasts pick out vary among them and include sites built often centuries, if not millennia apart, we can see that this is just creative invention. There certainly isn't any science involved. The Mohs scale. This is a relatively simple one, but it is an appeal to the Mohs scale of hardness to argue that a certain kind of tool would not have been able to carve a certain kind of material. Most often this is used to argue that a certain ancient culture, having only bronze tools, could not have carved granite or basalt or diorite or similar hard stone. People want to make this argument so that they can attribute ancient stonework to a lost advanced civilization. But this is unscientific for two reasons. One, because hardness does not determine whether a material can be carved. In fact, a material can be extremely hard, but brittle, and therefore can be carved. A diamond, for example, which is a 10 on the Mohs scale of hardness, can be smashed with an iron hammer. Iron is only a 4 on the Mohs scale. And two, ancient cultures had stone tools. Stone tools made of hard stone can be used to carve hard stone. Another baseless principle often used to support pseudo-archaeology is appeal to pareidolia. Pareidolia, as you may know, is the human tendency to see recognizable images in accidental arrangements. That's like the stars we were just talking about. Pareidolia is real, and this is universally accepted. We all have this urge to find something meaningful in our environment, even if it isn't meaningful. For example, seeing animals in the clouds but some people use it as an argument to support pseudo-archaeological claims. In other words, if something they are looking at looks like a familiar object, it most likely is that object. Now, there are very basic forms of appeal to pareidolia that do not even bother to sound sciency. The most extreme examples are when people look at Egyptian glyphs or art and see modern objects or when they see geological formations and assume them to be made by humans. But appeal to pareidolia is not science, and of course it is a poor argument because it doesn't rely on any hard facts, just on our imagination. But there are forms of pareidolia that are dressed up to look more like a hard science, and that leads us to mathematical coincidences and sacred geometry. To be clear, sacred geometry exists. It originally referred to geometric forms with esoteric significance being incorporated into the design of European churches and cathedrals. We know this happened because we have the records to demonstrate it. The builders borrowed symbols from a secret society known as the Pythagorean Brotherhood, and they put the symbols into the designs. Some people have then taken this idea and applied it to ancient sites too. But without a record of this or clear and obvious symbols, how can you know for sure? Well, they approach it like a treasure hunt. They look for symbols and patterns, and they play around with math. The more complex the math, 
the more it looks like science. But this isn't really about math. The math doesn't lead them deductively to conclusions. It's about looking for patterns. And this is completely subjective, which means it relies on our internal biases, such as observer expectancy bias and confirmation bias, which means the people performing the analysis will find what they are already hoping to find. The use of math makes it look like something scientific and objective, but this is nothing more than pareidolia with numbers. If someone is trying to find a hidden message in an ancient object, you can rest assured they will find something. It doesn't mean it was put there by the maker, though. There you have some examples of fake science used in support of fake archaeology. Those promoting these ideas may use science lingo or complex mathematics, but this is a smokescreen to hide the irrationality of their basic arguments. If you have any other examples you can think of that could have gone into this list, let me know in the comments down below. If you like this channel and want to help support it, you can do so with a super thanks, or if you want to assist on a long-term basis, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash world of antiquity. You might like my little e-booklet, Why Ancient History Matters. It's designed to persuade people that the subject is important, even in the modern world. You might also wish to use it to help spread the word. So feel free to share it with someone you know. It's free for anyone who wants it. I've left the link in the description box below the video for you to grab a copy. Catch you later.